Here's why you hit now! Find your head, you understand English? Any given day, we'll find almost 700,000 police officers patrolling America's streets. Though they've become a constant presence in our lives, organized police departments are in fact a relatively new development. Prior to the mid-19th century, most cities employed constables and watchmen to help keep the peace. Constables dated from the Middle Ages and were generally unarmed. As a rule, they intervened in crimes only when there was the potential to earn a good fee. But as the urban population in the eastern United States swelled, there was a growing need for better ways to deter crime. For solutions, many cities looked across the Atlantic to London's Metropolitan Police. Founded in 1829, this was the first modern and professional police department in the world. They organized along military lines and wore distinctive uniforms. The creation of the force was championed by statesman Sir Robert Bobby Peel, hence the familiar nickname, Bobbies. Contrary to popular belief, some of these first patrolmen were allowed to carry weapons. They were given revolvers. Uh, one of the most famous would be the, uh, the Wembley Metropolitan Police. Um, it was actually used by the forces. It was a reliable, uh, powerful, robust little pistol. It would, uh, you would not feel unarmed uh, carrying one of these today. As you can see, it had a, a short barrel, a fairly small butt, double action. It was easy, for easy to be concealed and uh, a very, very effective little revolver. As a matter of fact, there's some supposition that this would be the, the very revolver that was uh, carried by Sherlock Holmes. In 1845, New York City established the first modern police department in the United States. Known as the New York Municipal Police Force, it copied London's organizational structure and imitated their uniforms. But city officials added their own finishing touch. They did agree to wear an eight-pointed copper star uh, with the seal of the city at the center. Uh, they, of course, uh, immediately shined that star up and began the patrolling with it. They were known in the press as the New Star Police, but they were known popularly on the streets as coppers, which later was, of course, shortened to cops. New York was just the start. Before long, cities all over the country had followed suit. At first, all of these new police departments were officially unarmed. Because of the political climate of the times, many feared that an armed police force might be viewed as an army of occupation. But politics aside, an officer of the law encountered many dangerous situations and a personally purchased firearm was sometimes the only means of defense. This single-shot Allen percussion pistol belonged to a Baltimore City police officer in the 1850s. This would have been probably the most inexpensive handgun that could be bought at the time. It only gave you one shot. It's a muzzle loader, percussion cap ignition. They were cheaper, easier to get, and the men were only being paid about a dollar or two dollars a day. So this was something that was very popular, very concealable. They could put it in their pants pocket, in their coat pocket, stick it in their belt, but still be accessible when they would need it. The problem being, they only had one shot. And if they were really into some problems on the street, they only had that one shot, so they had to make that count. In 1857, the Baltimore Police Department became the first in the country to officially adopt a standardized weapon. The city of Baltimore purchased one of these for each one of their police officers so that they would be better armed than they had been prior to this. The Colt 1849 pocket models were 31 caliber percussion revolvers. They were issued after an officer was nearly killed by a mob. Citizenry felt that they should have their officers better protected. This could be reloaded quicker and is a much more reliable handgun and probably even more accurate. The threat of mob violence coupled with a rising crime rate would eventually force other large cities to arm their officers. In New York, 
several major riots between 1849 and 1873 left hundreds of civilians and police dead. In 1895, Theodore Roosevelt became president of the New York City Board of Police Commissioners. Roosevelt instituted a wide range of reforms aimed at modernizing the police force, including the first standardization of weapons. I may explain that I have not the slightest sympathy with any policy which tends to put the policeman at the mercy of a tough, or which deprives him of efficient weapons. One of the things we did while in office was to train the men in the use of the pistol. A school of pistol practice was established, and the marksmanship of the force was wonderfully improved. Theodore Roosevelt, 1895. The police board announced that a, um, a new revolver would be adopted. It was a six-shot, 32 caliber double action Colt revolver and it would have a four inch barrel and that all police officers would train with this weapon officially and would carry this weapon and it would be inspected periodically and they would also be expected to uh, qualify uh, in terms of its safe use and so forth. In keeping with Roosevelt's policy of everything being definitely police, on the handle of this gun you can see it says New York Police. In 1901, the Board of Police again changed uh, the caliber designation of firearms uh, to a 38 caliber six-shot uh, double-action revolver. Over the next few years, the 38 caliber, whether made by Smith & Wesson, Colt, or another company, became the standard-issue police sidearm, not just in New York, but for the vast majority of departments in the United States. Cut out hammer. Hair trigger. You want to learn how to use it. Now watch me. Hollywood's depiction of the need for a well-armed and well-trained police force should come as no surprise in light of that city's history. Now reload, and I'll give you a few pointers. Yes, sir. In the early years of Los Angeles, bear in mind, at one time, the city of Los Angeles was, uh, had probably more killings and shootings in one week than Tombstone had in 20 years. It was a very violent community. And it probably didn't start to settle down until 1885, but basically the, uh, the weapons of the police officers were then uh, still the 38 caliber, and there was a lot of shootouts. Let's keep one thing in mind. That target represents a wanted felon. So let's go get him. This is similar to the type of weapon that the uh, first state police patrol would have carried on patrol on horseback. Um, it's a 38 Smith & Wesson. This, is, this particular model is the M&P model, military and police version. Gun similar to the Smith & Wesson Model 1038 were the workhorses of the police pretty much nationwide for many, many years. My father was a uh, policeman in Everett, Massachusetts. He carried a Smith & Wesson 38 for 20 years. The well-liked and venerable 38 withstood the test of time, although some departments eventually switched to the more powerful 357 Magnum. These are two versions of the Model 65 Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum revolver. Prior to 1986, when uh, you came on this job on the Mass State Police, you were issued two of these. One with the 4-inch barrel for duty wear, and one with a 3-inch barrel for off-duty wear. This is what you were expected to carry in your bathing suit when you're at the beach with your family. We were re required at the time to carry weapons at all times because we were considered on duty 24 hours a day. Uh, when I came on in 1986, and they continued to issue the 4-inch stainless, but then they also issued us a 38 bodyguard for off-duty carry, which made a lot more sense. Smaller gun. But times were changing, and eventually, the limitations of revolvers began to outweigh their benefits. What was needed was a new weapon that would incorporate a revolver's reliability while giving an officer in the field more firepower.
For much of the 20th century, police officers believed that their revolvers would be more than adequate for most circumstances. Open that door in the name of the law. Open it! But during the turbulent 1960s and 70s, police departments around the country found themselves under siege. It was a time of the civil rights movement, political activism, and mass protests. For the police, the old way of doing business wasn't working. Abuses and dangerous confrontations led many departments to rethink tactics and weapons. Most delegates to this convention do not know that thousands of young people are being beaten in the streets of Chicago. But far from the fields of political protests, law enforcement officers were also faced with a dangerous new challenge, a rapidly escalating crime rate. It soon became apparent that new and better guns were necessary. Among the most important advances in small weapons technology was the increasing reliability of semi-automatic pistols. By the late 1980s and early 1990s, most police departments decided to convert from revolvers to semi-automatics, like the Sig Sauer P226. We were issued this weapon and three magazines. We keep the, uh, the magazines with 15 round capacity. One was in the weapon, one round was in the chamber, it was topped off for 16 total, and we had another uh, two additional magazines in our magazine pouch. So each officer out there was armed with 46 rounds. The other advantage of a semi-automatic pistol, as opposed to a revolver, is the, the configuration and the overall profile of the weapon. This is much easier to carry day to day, much easier to conceal. Today, very few departments still use revolvers. But the new semi-automatic pistols most cops now carry are not without their inherent problems. Having handled a number of officer-involved shooting, you ask an officer, how many shots did you fire? Especially when we're using 38 revolvers. He say, I'd fired two shots. And you open it up and he'd fired six in the excitement. It's very emotional. I mean, things are happening, especially if you've had it where they'll shoot somebody. And with the adrenaline in all parties, you don't know you've hit anything. They just keep shooting. So the advent of these automatic weapons has caused another problem where there's a lot of shots fired, just in the excitement of it. But for the most part, the switch to automatics has been highly successful, particularly in undercover work, which often requires that officers do more with less. Undercover activities in and of themselves do involve a variety of activities that inherently can be dangerous for the officer. Undercover operations really are nothing new. If you stop and think about it, the Greeks and the Romans used undercover operatives in order to get strategic advantage on their enemies. One of the smallest semi-automatic handguns ever employed by undercover police was the Bauer 25 caliber pistol issued in 1970. This is a very, very small weapon. You can see this. I can hold this in the palm of my hand. And obviously, it takes up very little room. It's not something that the average police officer is going to carry. It is very, very easy to conceal. If it is detected by people that you are interacting with, it is not immediately going to give rise to questions about you being a police officer. Another favorite of Massachusetts undercover officers is the Walther PPK, issued in 1979. In terms of reliability and stopping power, the PPK is a significant improvement over the 25 caliber, but both share a critical characteristic neither looks like a cop's gun. There was one particular instance where a purchase uh, was going to be made of some cocaine, an undercover purchase, uh, at a location uh, in the inner city in Boston. Uh, upon entry into the location, uh, the officer that was making the buy was put up against the wall, patted down, and held at gunpoint. The Walther PPK was discovered during that pat down. It was very easy for the individuals that were selling that cocaine to me to understand, yeah, I'd certainly carry a gun, and this is certainly a gun that you might carry. If the revolver 
that had Mass State Police stamped on the backstrap had been discovered, the outcome probably would have been a little bit different. But as it was, the gun was as it should be, the purchase of cocaine was made, everybody went away happy, and the search warrant was later executed on the location. From muzzle-loading single-shot pistols, to revolvers, to semi-automatic handguns, the weapon on a police officer's belt has evolved with the times. But when greater firepower is needed, the officer in the field has historically turned to a different class of weapons. So keep in mind that if anything, we want low, right down at the bottom of that target. Right low, just about like that. Okay, let's try that. Very good, excellent. Though a sidearm is the essential weapon of the police, the shotgun is a close second in importance. In fact, during the 19th century, shotguns were sometimes the first weapons purchased by police departments. This weapon is a model 1842 U.S. military musket. It's made in the Springfield Arsenal in 1845. This was surplused out of the Army stockpiles after the Mexican War, sometime probably in the mid-1850s. In 1857, this was purchased by the Baltimore City Police Department along with 120 others. It was purchased for the possible use as either for riots or to be stored in the station houses and be available for any police officer who might have special circumstances. Business firms used to give $25 for the best shotgun marksman. But no matter whether the men hit the target or not, they were sure to get the reward. Inspector John Thorne, 1884. By the beginning of the 20th century, shotguns were standard equipment for most police forces. And the Winchester Repeating Arms Company led the way with its pump action model, introduced in 1897. This became almost overnight one of the most popular shotguns in the history of this country. And it was especially popular with police departments because here you had a multi shot pump action shotgun available with a short barrel that could be used by police agencies for almost any purpose. Now the primary consideration was for riot control or when dealing with very dangerous or well-armed individuals. It's easy for any officer to handle, to operate, point it, shoot it, and he would get the message across. This particular shotgun was purchased by the Omaha, Nebraska Police Department in 1922. This police video demonstrates why the shotgun is effective for crowd and riot control. As distance increases, the scatter pattern becomes wider, enabling an officer to exhibit the threat of force over a greater area. With a capacity of seven rounds, the shotgun can adequately meet the demands of almost any situation. Today, the Remington 870 is the standard choice for police around the world. We haven't chose to turn it in for anything else in 25 years. I think it's been very effective. As a matter of fact, I think personally, my personal opinion is that the 870 is one of the best police weapons that's out there. It's really what stood the, the test of time. It's a workhorse. It's a workhorse weapon. Uh, these weapons tend to stay in arsenals for, for many, many years. Uh, they can take a beating. If the bad guy is in range, so are you, if he's, if he's equipped with the weapon himself. So this might give you a little bit of an edge as far as you be able to create a little more space between yourself and the other person who's armed, and a little more accuracy. And if anything else, there is a great psychological impact just in that sound. And a lot of times, just that sound can cause the other person to rethink their position and uh, maybe decide to end, end the encounter without having to uh, go to that next level. But sometimes, even the power of shotguns hasn't been enough. Nowhere was this more horribly dramatized than in Austin, Texas, on August 1st, 1966. On that warm summer day, Charles Whitman, a 25-year-old ex-Marine, 
dragged a footlocker filled with guns and ammunition to the tower of the University of Texas. After barricading himself in, Whitman picked up a high-powered rifle and began a killing rampage, which lasted 96 terrifying minutes. Police officers, armed only with handguns, were essentially helpless. Citizens scrambled to the scene with privately owned hunting rifles and began to fire back. By the time a police officer finally broke through the barricade, Whitman had killed 16 people and wounded 31. Police departments around the country, shocked by the incident, were prompted to form their first SWAT teams. Soon, high-powered sniper rifles to combat terrorists like Whitman would become standard in their arsenals. This weapon here is a uh, Sig Sauer uh, model SSG 3000. It's uh, chambered in 308 caliber. That's a bolt action weapon, which means there's a magazine that usually holds uh, an average of five rounds. They do vary, and one round can be chambered at a time. This weapon can be fired at several hundred yards accurately. You have a Leupold. It's a one by 10 power scope. You know, everybody thinks yeah, you're a sniper, you're way out away from the action, but this is probably one of the most important jobs on the team because they let us know via the radio what they're seeing and they're actually our eyes for us when we're approaching to do some type of tactical maneuver. To address the need for increased firepower, many departments are also training their officers in the use of military-style assault rifles. The M16 was adopted by the Army during the Vietnam War. In fully automatic mode, it has a cyclic rate of between 700 and 950 rounds per minute. This weapon here is uh, another mainstay on the uh, Mass State Police stop team. What this is is a uh, Colt model M16 M4 chambered in uh, 223 caliber or uh, 556 millimeter. We have a shortened down barrel on this weapon as well as a retractable stock can make it uh, shorter, longer, depending on uh, what you're using it for. We also have a different sighting system on this weapon. It's a red dot sighting system, which is what we consider point of aim, point of impact. Using this sight, it's simply put the red dot on your target, and um, where that red dot is is where, you, uh, where your bullet's going to hit. High-powered sniper and assault rifles are giving law enforcement officers a much-needed edge in combating some of the most violent criminal elements. But recently, some perpetrators have become much bolder, often demonstrating a level of mayhem and destruction reminiscent of one of the most lawless periods in American history, the Roaring Twenties. In 1920, the 18th Amendment was passed, outlawing the manufacture and sale of alcohol. Prohibition gave birth to a new breed of criminal, the bootlegger. It also sparked an unprecedented wave of urban violence. As gangland wars erupted, police departments tried to keep the country dry. Daily raids destroyed massive amounts of illegal alcohol. However, police often found themselves outmanned and outgunned. It was an era that is often defined by a single weapon, the Thompson submachine gun. Though created for the military, the gun was largely ignored until it became associated with notorious outlaws like John Dillinger. Pretty Boy Floyd, Machine Gun Kelly, and Al Capone. Incredibly, owning a Tommy gun was not that difficult. Anyone with $225 could purchase one by mail order or from the local hardware store. With a firing rate of 800 rounds per minute, it gave criminals an unheard of advantage. There was only one way to even the odds. Soon law enforcement organizations nationwide were outfitting their officers and agents with Tommy guns. But the Thompson did have its limitations. In a gun battle with Bonnie and Clyde, 
Famed Texas lawman Ted Hinton found that the Tommy gun was not as all-powerful as advertised. Bonnie and Clyde were able to escape unscathed. Later, in the climactic shootout with the infamous couple, Hinton and his deputies took no chances. A Browning automatic rifle, a Remington semi-automatic rifle, a 12-gauge Remington shotgun, and two 45 Colt automatics left Bonnie and Clyde dead and their car in tatters. Though it was not always preferred, the Thompson did gain some acceptance with both law enforcement and the military. American soldiers carried it as recently as World War II in the Vietnam era, and it was used by various police departments until the 1980s. You could put a magazine or a clip into the Thompson and just uh, fire off 40, 50, 75 rounds uh, in a few seconds. They were part of the armament. I joined the Los Angeles Police Department in 61. I can remember the 45 Thompson submachine guns being in the gun locker. They were used by officers when they went out on arrest. I don't know if they were ever actually used. Uh, more of a show of strength, probably. This is a Thompson uh, submachine gun. It's uh, 48 ACP caliber. It was uh, manufactured in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. This happens to be a 1928 A1 model that the Massachusetts State Police uh, got briefly after uh, the Second World War. They were given to the State Police by the National Guard, and for the most part, the Thompson submachine gun was kept in the prison stations. That would be barracks where a prison was nearby. If there was a riot or something along those lines, that this particular uh, weapon would be used in quelling the riot. If there was somebody escaping from police, a suspect that was in the woods or somebody who was dangerous, this gun would be used in that application. Today, the Tommy gun is considered technically obsolete. Yet its history illustrates an ongoing struggle for law enforcement, how to keep up with the bad guys. Even now, 70 years after prohibition, the police can still find themselves lagging behind the firepower employed by hardened criminals. This was especially true in the suburban Los Angeles city of North Hollywood in March of 1997, when two heavily armed gunmen were foiled during an attempted bank heist, a terrifying shootout ensued in the city streets. The event was televised live across the nation. The bank robbers seemed determined to stop at nothing. They wore protective clothing, including bulletproof vests, and they were armed with a cache of powerful automatic weapons. The police were seriously outgunned. The Los Angeles Police Department is, is like any major police department. Until you have a major event, like say for them, like the, in this case, the North Hollywood Bank shootout, until the event comes up, they realize that the officers were the 38 were undergunned. They also realized that in this particular case, these suspects were wearing a body armament. Hopefully that never happens again, but it could. And so, in effect, the weapons they were firing at them were totally ineffective. Officers on the scene scrambled to find weapons that could even the odds. Just to look at the situation that happened in L.A. Uh, with the bank robbery there, and they were better armed than the police. And uh, from the reports that I heard, the police were going at the gun stores and borrowing weapons of this type to go out and engage the threat, to kind of balance the uh, firepower out there. The bank robbers were eventually stopped, but the damage had been done. Both gunmen were dead, and 18 people had been wounded. However, a valuable lesson had been learned, and the general consensus was for a need to better arm law enforcement officers. Never, ever again do I want to see officers of the Los Angeles Police Department outgunned. Never, ever again do I want to see them having to rush to a gun shop in order to be able to equalize the firepower of the thugs that they are opposing. With that in mind, advanced weapons such as the Heckler & Koch MP5 
are being issued to police departments across the nation. This gun that I'm about to shoot is the MP5. It has a retractable stock. The only accessories that it has on is a surefire light. It has the Navy trigger group that will go on safe, semi-auto, and in fully auto. I will load two 30-round magazines that are side-by-side -side in a magazine clamp, and I will fire two three-round bursts initially. The MP5 is now used by many local law enforcement agencies, as well as by the FBI and the Secret Service. This member of the MP5 family is the MP5 SD, SD for being suppressed. The difference here is that it has a suppressor on it and it should be reasonably a quiet gun to fire. The application of this gun here is oftentimes a tactical team making an approach on a house Typically, narcotic salespeople will occupy the house or the yard with a sentry dog. This tool here could be used to neutralize a sentry dog. Some agencies just like to be operating in an environment where there is not the reported sounds of gunshots. In other words, any reported gunshots would be by a suspect, perhaps. A sound suppressor can also be an effective tool in allowing police officers to maintain an element of surprise. But the impressive power of an MP5 can be measured in other ways as well, most notably by the success stories of officers in the field. In this particular case, there were three state troopers. We were acting in the capacity as being significant drug distributors. <clears throat> we were working out of a stretch limousine making our deliveries. Uh, and in order to give credibility, more credibility, to the foundation that had already been laid and to help ensure the safety of the officers, we let it be known that during the course of our deliveries, we routinely not only carry weapons, but we carry semi-automatic weapons and machine guns. This particular weapon right here is an H&K MP5K. This is the weapon that was used in one of those undercover operations. And it was worn, configured in a shoulder rig on a swivel hanging right underneath the right arm, and it was concealed by a sport coat. When the wind blew the sport coat open, they could see it was there, and it spoke, it spoke volumes. And it did two things. The first thing it did was it helped ensure the safety of the officers involved in that operation, because you're certainly going to think twice before you try any aggressive action. And the second part of it was it gave credibility to the foundation that we had already laid about being serious drug distributors. And the end result of it was, was a significant arrest, seizure of a large amount of money. Submachine guns like the MP5 are the latest example of how police must remain on the cutting edge of weapons technology in order to stay one step ahead of the criminals. But in the next millennium, the weapons of the police will need to be even more complex and sophisticated. When Sergeant Ken Cunningham of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department goes to work each day, he never knows what types of violent situations he might encounter. The most dangerous scenarios could find Cunningham too under gun to meet a challenge to his authority. His life, as well as the lives of innocent civilians, could hang in the balance. Cunningham patrols his beat with a sophisticated assortment of lethal and non-lethal weapons. All of it geared to help save lives. The typical handgun that law enforcement is using right now in the 90s is an auto loader. Uh, that's basically what the LA County Sheriff's Department uses. Uh, the auto loader we use is the 9mm as manufactured by Beretta. When I'm on duty and carrying this weapon, Typically, I will carry two magazines on me, one magazine on each pouch for a total of three magazines or 46 rounds. And that's pretty much the law enforcement standard. This is our standard issue shotgun for the Sheriff's Department. We use it at all our patrol station. Uh, this is a 12 gauge uh, pump shotgun manufactured by the Ithaca Company. There's nothing that is more scary than hearing 
that sound and the bad guys know you're coming and that you got this thing. And I've seen people's hands go up in the air and guns hit the ground real quick just when they hear that noise because they know what it is. They have some respect for it. They pretty much know what it can do. They don't want to argue with a shotgun. In the trunk of Cunningham's patrol car is an impressive arsenal of weapons, which can help defuse almost any violent confrontation. This is a less than lethal force option that the Sheriff's Department utilizes. It shoots around a 12 gauge shotgun round. It's called a flexible baton. This is none other than a round of ammunition with essentially a small bean bag inside of it. People that these have been used on, they describe it as being hit with a baseball. They say it's the same thing as if somebody wound up and threw them a good 60, 70 mile an hour pitch and hit them in the chest with a baseball. Okay, the next one I have, it's a less than lethal alternative. It's called the Yarwin. You can launch tear gas with it. Explosive shells can be uh, delivered with this. We'd use it in order to subdue, say, someone who was uh, extremely intoxicated on drugs and we might deploy something like this to knock him down with so we can get him into custody without having to engage in some type of an all-out fight with the subject. This is the round of ammunition it fires. It's got a powder charge, it's a projectile. I describe it as being a large rubber, like a rubber pencil eraser. It's a large piece of rubber. It extends all the way down to here. When we fire it, this large rubber projectile exits the weapon. For the most extreme and life-threatening situations, Cunningham is also equipped with an AR-15 assault rifle. Essentially, this gun comes into play when we're up against a suspect or suspects that are armed with long guns. We want to maintain parity with them. It gives us reach that the Beretta doesn't have. It also gives us a rapid fire capability along with more stopping power. Sergeant Cunningham is supplied with the very latest firearms in a rapidly evolving fight to stay ahead of criminals. But creating new weapons typically requires years of trial and error. Some innovative ideas are quickly adopted. Others, thankfully, are not. An electronic gun fired from within the police car. Inventor Stockholm dismantles the gun to show the 21-shot cartridge chamber and firing mechanism located on the hood. The gun solves an officer's problem of how to drive his car at high speed while firing at the same time. In this case, all he has to do is aim the car itself at the target and pull the trigger. The trigger activates the mechanism on the hood electrically, while a special instrument tells the driver if his aim is right. He can fire accurately at 120 miles an hour. In the 1950s, the electronic hood gun probably seemed like the ultimate in futuristic weaponry. It stands in stark contrast to the more realistic innovations that are being tested today. Lieutenant Sid Heal of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department specializes in technology exploration. It's his job to see into the future and to come up with alternatives to the use of deadly force. One of the technologies that's being explored for officers in the field are so-called smart weapons. This is an example of a, of a projectile that uh, could very easily have a computer incorporated into it. What, what it does is, is that it uh, is fired through a launcher, conventional tear gas launcher. Instead of having prongs, it has a very, very sticky glue. In fact, I'll just barely touch it because it's so sticky that it's, it's like super glue. But what happens is, is it, it, it's fired and it sticks. And then when it falls down, these wires become electrical conductors. And then it fires an electrical jolt that constricts and contracts the muscles so rapidly that the individual loses his balance. The next generation might have a chip so that the individual falls down and it immediately stops. Less than lethal alternatives might also include guns like this that utilize jets of air instead of gunpowder. This is one of the 
first models of less lethal devices that we've been looking at. It's made by Upco, and they originally were in the business of manufacturing ejection seats for military aircraft. But the engineers, because it's all pneumatic, have come up with a, for, instance, for lack of a better term, a non-firearm. It doesn't use gunpowder. It doesn't use casings or cartridges. It just shoots projectiles, and it does it with compressed air. Now, at some point in time, this could actually have a laser or a computer chip incorporated right into it that would also measure the distance and adjust the amount of air that was propelling the projectile. And because of that, it would hit with enough force to cause uh, pain and compliance, but not enough to cause injury. And it would adjust itself whether you're inside a room or outside at a, uh, at a park, for instance. Lasers are also being developed as non-lethal devices. This is a, a laser that's a prototype. I've already seen the second prototype, which is about half the size and weighs about a third as much. Uh, but how that works is uh, by affecting a person's eyes. Now, to the degree that a person's eye doesn't have the ability to see, it uh, inhibits his ability to attack us, for instance, or hurt himself or hurt someone else. What firearms will police officers be carrying 20 years from now? The challenges of the new century may someday inspire weaponry that is truly futuristic. If we had the ultimate non-lethal device, it would be a phaser, like you see on Star Trek. That first aired on a Thursday in 1966. There's probably not a single person in the civilized world that cannot describe the sound and what it does and what it looks like. It's 100% safe. It's 100% discriminating. It means that you can identify one individual in a crowd and leave everybody else alone. It's 100% reversible. It's environmentally benign. It's rechargeable. It's portable. In 2010, I think there's going to be some breakthroughs in the less lethal arena. Uh, there's a number of research programs that are already starting to, to show results. Chemical pulse lasers, microwave devices, directed energy, nerve stimulation then what would happen is that we would have the ability of intervening even against lethal force with a non-lethal option. So that would have tremendous appeal. For more than 150 years, America's police from New York City to Los Angeles have been on the front lines in a never-ending battle against rioters, mobsters, and criminals. But through it all, the most important weapons have not always been the ones attached to a patrol officer's utility belt. It's my belief as the superintendent that the most important resource this, the, this agency has is not the helicopters, not the cruisers, not the radio systems, not the guns, the weapon system. It's the individuals. Though criminals often utilize a vast array of weapons equal to those of the police, they lack the essential ingredient that might allow them to get the upper hand. That ingredient is embodied by thousands of law enforcement personnel across the nation. It's the commitment to do what's right. The solemn oath to protect and serve every law-abiding citizen. of weapons. I may explain that I have not the slightest sympathy with any policy which tends to put the policeman at the mercy of a tough, or which deprives him of efficient weapons. One of the things we did while in office was to train the men in the use of the pistol. A school of pistol practice was established, and the marksmanship of the force was wonderfully improved. Theodore Roosevelt, 1895. The police board announced that a um, 
a new revolver would be adopted. It was a six-shot, 32 caliber double-action Colt revolver, and it would have a four-inch barrel, and that all police officers would train with this weapon officially and would carry this weapon, and it would be inspected periodically, and they would also be expected to uh, qualify uh, in terms of its safe use and so forth in keeping with Roosevelt's policy of everything being definitely police, on the handle of this gun, you can see it says New York Police. In 1901, the Board of Police again changed uh, the caliber designation of firearms uh, to a 38 caliber six-shot uh, double-action revolver. Over the next few years, the 38 caliber, whether made by Smith & Wesson, Colt, or another company, Any given day, we'll find almost 700,000 police officers patrolling America's streets. Though they've become a constant presence in our lives, organized police departments are in fact a relatively new development. Prior to the mid-19th century, most cities employed constables and watchmen to help keep the peace. Constables dated from the Middle Ages and were generally unarmed. As a rule, they intervened in crimes only when there was the potential to earn a good fee. But as the urban population in the eastern United States swelled, there was a growing need for better ways to deter crime. For solutions, many cities looked across the Atlantic to London's Metropolitan Police. Founded in 1829, this was the first modern and professional police department in the world. They organized along military lines and wore distinctive uniform. And if they were really into some problems on the street, they only had that one shot, so they had to make that count. In 1857, the Baltimore Police Department became the first in the country to officially adopt a standardized weapon. The city of Baltimore purchased one of these for each one of their police officers so that they would be better armed than they had been prior to this. The Colt 1849 pocket models were 31 caliber percussion revolvers. They were issued after an officer was nearly killed by a mob. Citizenry felt that they should have their officers better protected. This could be reloaded quicker and is a much more reliable handgun and probably even more accurate. The threat of mob violence coupled with a rising crime rate would eventually force other large cities to arm their officers. In New York, several major riots between 1849 and 1873 left hundreds of civilians and police dead. In 1895, Theodore Roosevelt became president of the New York City Board of Police Commissioners. Roosevelt instituted a wide range of reforms aimed at modernizing the police force including the first standardization began the patrolling with it they were known in the press as the new star police but they were known popularly on the streets as coppers which later was of course shortened to cops new york was just the start before long cities all over the country had followed suit at first all of these new police departments were officially unarmed because of the political climate of the times, many feared that an armed police force might be viewed as an army of occupation. But politics aside, an officer of the law encountered many dangerous situations. And a personally purchased firearm was sometimes the only means of defense. This single-shot Allen percussion pistol belonged to a Baltimore City police officer in the 1850s. This would have been probably the most inexpensive handgun that could be bought at the time. It only gave you one shot. It's a muzzle loader, percussion cap ignition. They were cheaper, easier to get, and the men were only being paid about a dollar or two dollars a day. So this was something that was very popular, very concealable. They could put it in their pants pocket, in their coat pocket, stick it in their belt. 
but still be accessible when they would need it. The problem being, they only had one shot. The creation of the force was championed by statesman Sir Robert Bobby Peel, hence the familiar nickname, Bobbies. Contrary to popular belief, some of these first patrolmen were allowed to carry weapons. They were given revolvers. Uh, one of the most famous would be the, uh, the Wibley Metropolitan Police. Um, it was actually used by the forces. It was a reliable, uh, powerful, robust little pistol. It would, uh, you would not feel unarmed uh, carrying one of these today. As you can see, it had a, a short barrel, a fairly small butt, double action. It was easy, for easy to be concealed and uh, a very, very effective little revolver. As a matter of fact, there's some supposition that this would be the, the very revolver that was uh, carried by Sherlock Holmes. In 1845, New York City established the first modern police department in the United States. Known as the New York Municipal Police Force, it copied London's organizational structure and imitated their uniforms. But city officials added their own finishing touch. They did agree to wear an eight-pointed copper star uh, with the seal of the city at the center. Uh, they, of course, uh, immediately shined that star up. 